Before we dive into today's insightful discussion, I want to share some updates that will enhance your FemPower Health experience. We're excited to launch our new interactive newsletter. This weekly newsletter is packed with the latest scientific findings, business insights, and essential updates in the realm of women's health. Signing up is easy. Just visit our website or click the link in the show notes. Our website is also a comprehensive resource organized by topic for your convenience. Whether you're delving into the latest research, exploring any trends in healthcare, or seeking information in specific health topics, it's all there at your fingertips. Additionally, for our Spotify users, we've created playlists categorized by these topics, offering you another way to stay informed and engaged. And for those listening on Apple Podcasts, while we can't categorize content within the app, our website remains a central hub for all of these resources. And be sure to take advantage of these tools to stay on top of the evolving world of women's health, science, and business. Now let's get started with today's episode. This is FemPower Health. Each week, top women's health experts dispel fact from fiction. The most important pelvic floor exercise is not the Kegel. Challenge the status quo. It's It's never easy to challenge the accepted leaders, and especially if you're a woman. Provide perspective on why your healthcare journey may be so tough. All of that fear and worry, it all upregulates our nervous system, puts us into fight or flight mode, and increases our pain sensitivity. And what you can do about it. The number one thing is you have to advocate for yourself, and you have to be prepared. Your journey to get empowered starts now. This is FemPower Health. Each week, top women's health experts dispel fact from fiction. The most important pelvic floor exercise is not the Kegel. Challenge the status quo. It's never easy to challenge the accepted leaders, and especially if you're a woman. Provide perspective on why your healthcare journey may be so tough. All of that fear and worry, it all upregulates our nervous system, puts us into fight or flight mode, and increases our pain sensitivity. And what you can do about it. The number one thing is you have to advocate for yourself, and you have to be prepared. Your journey to get empowered starts now. But because of our lack of training, we don't really have resources that we need for our patients. And so because of that, I joined and found out and joined a medical society called ISWISH, became a fellow of that. They study evidence-based interventions for women's sexual health. And I'm like, wow, like we don't have to tell women to drink a glass of wine. We don't have to tell them to get a new partner or like, you know, whatever these other like non- Uh, respectful, non-evidence-based things that we're recommending to our patients. We don't have to do that. How many of you struggle with trying to talk to your doctor about your sexual health? It might feel incredibly awkward. Well, you might be surprised to know that your doctor may feel the same way. Enter Dr. Lindsay Harper. She is the founder of Rosie. It is an app designed to transform the conversation between patient and doctor when it comes to your sexual health. I will let Dr. Harper explain the rest to you, including how she came about creating this company. So tell us about your background and really what was happening in your office environment that made you decide, you know, I'm going to be a founder of a company to help those with their sexual health questions. Yeah, well, thanks. I mean, I love talking about women's sexual health. So thanks for giving me the opportunity to do it. Um, And I didn't know that I would always love it. I knew that I, like from a young age, always wanted to be a doctor. And then when I got into medical school, I found that I love to do surgery. So I wanted to do a surgical um, specialty. And I did, it's very interesting. I did an erectile dysfunction clinic at the VA and then decided I did not ever want to take care of men. (laughs) So by process, process of elimination, I got into becoming an OBGYN, which I mean, I love so much and love taking care of women, love all of the aspects of patient care that we get to be involved in and love so much the continuity of it. So when you're thinking about, you know, what kind of doctor you're going to be, if you want to be a surgeon, you usually just get to see patients for when they need surgery and then they go back to their, you know, other doctors. But as an OBGYN, you get to be surgical, but you also get to take care of women throughout their lifespan, oftentimes from when they're young in their teens till, you know, till when they die. And so that's such a special opportunity as someone who really values connection. 
when I was in private practice as an OBGYN, I felt confident at the things I had been trained for, but there were concerns that were coming up on a really regular basis with, with my patients. And these included um, things like low sexual desire. I have, I had several patients, I mean, in like within the, a few days when this all started to kind of get really concentrated in my mind, say, you know, I never want to have sex again. I feel like if I tell anybody, they'll look at me like I have three heads or people were having trouble with orgasms that hadn't been present before or sexual pain, which is so common. Histories of sexual trauma, which is so common, we know. But unfortunately, as an OBGYN, most of us are not trained to handle these issues. And so I it was like this first time where I felt like, OK, my patients have a need and I truly don't know how to help them. I don't know how to deliver on that for them. And the worst part about it was, it's not like their toe was hurt and I couldn't help. They had spent their emotional energy. They had built up their confidence and courage to disclose something super private to me. And I just left it hanging, left it flat, like completely could not acknowledge that sense of responsibility that had been given to me with any valid resources. And so this was really bothering me. And so I started asking around, I asked my partners whom I love and respect and are amazing doctors. They didn't really have any good answers. I asked in a group of women physicians on Facebook and I started to notice a trend, which is that a lot of people were feeling like I did, which is we come into contact with this problem every day, but because of our lack of training, we don't really have resources that we need for our patients. And so because of that, I joined and found out and joined a medical society called ISWISH, became a fellow of that. They study evidence-based interventions for women's sexual health. And I'm like, wow, like we don't have to tell women to drink a glass of wine. We don't have to tell them to get a new partner or like, you know, whatever these other like non- uh, respectful, non-evidence-based things that we're recommending to our patients, we don't have to do that. The problem is this discrepancy of information that's available to us in residency as physicians, in society as women, that there's just an information gap. And so that's really where the wheels started turning for like, how can we do this? And I didn't know I was going to be a founder of a technology company. I'm just trying to solve this information gap problem, which by sharing this information can do so much, right? It can be therapeutic. It can actually improve sexual health. But even bigger than that, it, rela it removes and erases this sexual shame and isolation that we as women feel because of this complete lack of conversation of our sexual problems and society. So we definitely have a very tactical reason for existing, but we also have a much more, you know, philosophical, social good reason for existing, which is to really um, erase all of those unnecessary feelings that that women are feeling about the sexual problems that so many of us are, are having. So you went from this idea and now you've built this app. So what would you want people to be aware of with respect to the app. And by the way, I do have people who listen to the podcast who are healthcare providers mm -hmm. and patients. And so feel free to share messages to both of them about what you're really trying to do here, who this yeah. is for and how to utilize it. Absolutely. So, I mean, my, my founder story as a physician who needed resources for her patients is really to address Exactly that, right? So we, I know very well that doctors in their office have 10 minutes to spend with patients and we're lucky if we get through our entire checklist and not very many of us ask about sexual health. And that's because we're not trained. And number two, even if we have a patient who answers us affirmatively about a sexual health problem, we don't really have any good resources until now, right? Dot, dot, dot. Um, but, and that's really where Rosie's supposed to fit in, right? We don't, I really do want all physicians to be asking about sexual health, but I realize that's not possible without a resource like the one that we've created. And so it's to say, hey, you can ask your patients and if they have an issue, you can send them our way. A ton of our educational content is completely free, which I know is a huge you know, um, draw for healthcare providers and those referrals. The, the library of erotica is paid and also the classes are paid. And classes are really deep dives into specific topics like sexual trauma, religion and sexuality, um, uh, orgasm concerns, menopause. I mean, we have, they run the gamut. Um, and so, and, and if a patient or if a user does decide to subscribe, it's $10 a month. So it's a, you know, low cost comparatively to some other, you know, if we were to compare it to some other educational or therapeutic resources. Something that's really important for me as a brand is that 
all the parts of Rosie are evidence-based. And so for us, whenever I was thinking, okay, how do we make this, this um, sort of vision come to life? Basically, I just took the evidence-based resources that we have established in sexual health, which are to say, we know education improves sexual health. We know self-help improves sexual health. We know erotica improves sexual health, right? So erotica for us, is not we're not like an erotica media company we're a erotica as a prescription company right all of our erotica is written by women it's all written from you know really honoring that most women experience orgasm through clitoral stimulation like we're very focused on what is sex like for women and portraying that in these stories much to your much to your like wonderful review. Thank you so much. Um, but also, and, and all the content with the exception of the erotica on the platform. So all of the educational and self-help content are created by either sex medicine doctors, OBGYNs, public floor physical therapists, um, sex therapists. Um, so we have this really um, holistic, multidisciplinary approach, which is how I feel that all of healthcare should be approached, but specifically sexual health, because they're just too intertwined to extrapolate them. And we wouldn't want to. Why would we ever want to not acknowledge that sexuality is a whole body, whole mind, whole person, even a relational experience? And the technology platform gives us the opportunity to honor women's sexuality in that way, and also to really bridge that gap between what physicians are able to offer in the office and what you know we need as women to really have the um, ability and the empowerment to address our own sexual health concerns. Now, a question for you around men's sexual health and how it relates. So and this is kind of a two-part question, but potentially a global answer. So I'll ask both okay. questions. So I recently interviewed Dr. Rachel Rubin and the episode title is Your Orgasm Questions Answered. Such a great episode. Um, so as you can see, I'm just enjoying talking about sex. So I'm just going to keep yes, interviewing sex we, I do too. We should, we should talk about it we more. We should. Right? One of the statements that she made in there, and I think we kind of know this, but because she is a sex expert to, or as I should say, sexual health specialist, um, the way she said it, I think, and because of her credibility, it like hit me in a way that hadn't before. She basically said, we all got a crappy sex education, men and women totally. alike. Um, but I do think sometimes we women think men know more. So that's part one. Um, so I wanted to get your reaction to that. But part two is, isn't there more information and guidance for men in some respect? Because let's talk, you know, face that I'm not sure what all men's health magazine promotes. And we know that there's porn out there, which shows everything fake. But just generally speaking, like when you talk about, about erectile dif dysfunction, like Viagra came out, but where was anything for women for a really long time, right? right? So I'm just so curious, you have this tool that's helping women. Men also got a crappy sex education, but they kind of sort of have more information than women ever had. So then how does Rosie play into that dynamic, assuming it's a male female relationship because we know there's sure. so many different relationships out there. Yeah, I think we do assume that men know more probably unfairly. I think that all of us have terrible sort of baseline sex literacy, sexual health literacy, and that's something that we could definitely do better uh, as a society as a world um in general. And so I think that there is a misconception that men know more. They might they might know more about certain things. We definitely talk more about men's external genitalia and about the function of it and about the dis the dysfunction of it. Um, and like to your point, the treatment um, for you know male sexual dysfunction. But I don't think I think that sometimes for men, sexual health things are oversimplified. I think that you know it's like oh here's your here's your pill, and while that works for a lot of men, it doesn't address the whole person like like we at Rosie really value. And so luckily for me, I've had the opportunity to build this company, be a representative of how I think sexual health should be approached. And for men, you know there isn't a corollary necessarily. They do have very easy, covered, wide access to medications for men's sexual dysfunction, which we do not have, right? So there's only two FDA approved medicines for women. They're very rarely covered by insurance. You know, it's a, it's a, uh, the pharma field is widely discrepant. I would say the informational 
um, gap for men and women is probably equal. And Rosie is hoping to close that for women for sure. Um, but the opportunity is still there for men as well. And the role that we play in closing that gap for men, we hear this a lot, which is an unintended use of the platform, but I love, and I don't know why I didn't think of it, but that women will watch our educational videos and also read erotica with their partners, right? Male or female. And that it can be used to say, hey, this isn't just me saying something about you. For example, one, one way that that happens a lot is if a woman, for example, has low sexual desire, the partner thinks that it's a statement about them, right? That about their physique or about their, you know, whatever ability to please. But the woman has been trying to convey for a long time that actually it's not about you at all. This is a me issue. And so I think we do a good job of articulating some of those challenges that maybe in the stress and emotional weight of a relationship are harder to do. So sometimes we can take that off of the shoulders of the women um, on our platform and as well inspire new things through, you know, sharing of erotica or through some of the classes and um, meditations that we offer on the platform. Um, so I love that. I love that it's starting conversations. That's really what we want to do. It's backing those conversations with evidence um, and it's really giving um, the the credibility to to women who sometimes need that extra boost to say, hey, this is how I'm feeling and it's valid and it's heard and it's not just me um, to help give them that confidence to really express how they're feeling within their partnerships. That's great. And because this is an app, you're able to track data. I know, um, yeah. I guess just for anyone who's hears the word tracking, I don't want to scare anyone. It's You're probably looking at de-identified data to look at totally. trends of people. So I just want to clarify what I mean by data. What I would love to know is what are some of the interesting things that you're seeing? And, and part of what makes me think of this is I think the first time I heard you speak was when you were pitching for um, some competition related to menopause related products. So I had a misnomer that this was a menopause product. So I'm glad to know okay. it's for everyone. Yeah, for everyone. And you had mentioned, and there's some interesting information you learned about the use of the term erotica. And so I would just love to learn, you know, what would be helpful for listeners to better understand based on what the data is, and you've alluded to some of it already, but just, is there any other interesting information you wanted to share about what you all are learning that might help consumers? Totally. I mean, that's the really cool thing about, um, you know, having a technology company in a really nascent field is that we have the ability not only to offer this as an intervention, but also to really learn a lot about how women are experiencing sexuality, how they would like for it to be addressed, how the, the interventions that we're offering are affecting those things. I mean, just it, we could go on and on and on. And so for me as a physician, I view it as part of my obligation to really give back to the, you know, to the sexual health um, community, all the things that we're learning, because we have you know, larger data sets than most people would ever dream of. And I'm so thankful for that. Um, and so we've learned so much and we've, we've presented at seven medical and psychological conferences in the last year. Um, and we have efficacy data about when women use Rosie that their sexual health improves across four domains. Um, one thing that I think that is really interesting is the use of Rosie and you know, how women use it. I think that um, uh, some women come to Rosie just for the erotica, right? Like that's a very important part of the platform. Others come for education and there's about a half and half split between those two activities. But women who um, see the most sexual improve, sexual function improvement with Rosie are those who are reading erotica. So whenever we talk about erotica as a prescription, we're not joking. <laughs> it's less expensive than a medication. It has no <laughs> side effects. Um, and it can really, it can do so much. It can improve orgasm. It can improve desire. It can improve arousal. It can improve lubrication. Um, and so really thinking of it in that way, I think can be super powerful and, and a message that we like to spread. It's like, hey, well, we, we are limited on our FDA approved medications for women, but actually we have behavioral interventions that work really well too. And I think that that really resonates with women because we don't really want to take more medicines. Like I, I can speak for myself and I know for a lot of our users that the last thing we're wanting to do is add another pharmaceutical. Not that those shouldn't be available. Very pro FDA approval of women's sexual health medications, not to be um, unclear on that. I view actually sexual health a lot like I view mental health issues, for example, depression. 
which is to say there are a lot of things educationally and behaviorally that all of us should be doing. And then there are some of us that need medicine, right? And that's totally fine. And that is what it is. And for those people, we are so thankful that those medications exist. The same exact sort of um, setup is true for women's sexual health, which is that we all have a lot of education to be done. We all have some behavioral interventions that we could do to improve. Some of us need medicines. Those should be widely available and covered. Um, but I could go on for days about our data. We had we did a bunch of COVID-19 studies because we had data pre and post. Um, and we looked at patients who um, put, would qualify perhaps for a diagnosis of hypoactive sexual desire disorder, which is a desire, a desire disorder where that women can experience to see if Rosie was um, an efficacious intervention and it was statistically significant. So there's so much going on that I'm so excited about. And really, um, we'll, that's a huge opportunity for us moving forward that I think will be have the ability to really change the way that the world sees women's sexual health. Wow. Now, one thing I didn't research, and as you were talking, I just thought about it, is do you have anything focused on couples struggling with infertility? Because getting on that road of, okay, this is the day, these are the five days, like yeah. the schedule. After, I mean, for me, it was four years. It was a wow. nightmare. Yeah. Um, so curious if you have anything focused on that. We do. Actually, this fall, we just released like our, a series where we did um, where we included a class specifically all about infertility. So in that deep dive section of the app, which is what I was talking about, we worked with a, an OBGYN who focuses on sexual health named Tammy Rowan. She and Rachel and I all know each other well. Um, and then a perinatal psychiatrist and then also a pelvic floor physical therapist to really address infertility from, you know, the whole mind, body, sex connection and help users really to just have a place to you know, experience those feelings to understand what could we do to optimize wellness during infertility. There's never going to make, there's never going to be anything a medicine or an app or whatever that's going to make that journey easy. That's a tough right. journey. It is. But what we can do is we can talk about it more. We can support one another better. We can acknowledge and hold space for women and their partners going through that journey. Um, and we can offer evidence-based, you know, information, which is to say, hey, we know that couples experiencing infertility who do this, you know, may have um, better sexual health outcomes than this, right? We can offer ideas to separate sex from conception and things like that. So um, really proud to be able to do those things because they're, that's the cool thing, honestly, about sexual health is that there's nothing that doesn't touch it, right? Stress touches sexual health, infertility touches it, surgery, um, other medical con conditions, chronic pain, our partner's sexual problems, or just partnership problems in general. So while sort of the party line is that sexual health is complicated, I actually think that's the beauty of it, right? That's the opportunity in it is that we can, something can be, you know, um, can be intricate and, and still be worthwhile and worthy of addressing. And digital health actually is like the perfect platform for that. So I think the time for all of this is, is exactly right. No, it's absolutely perfect. And I also like that people can be connected to sexual health experts because one of the, it's funny, I've been doing this podcast for a while. I've been in healthcare my entire career. And to this day, I, I chuckle because I'm like, there will be something that comes up. Like, for example, my knees, the backs of my knees are starting, or the back of my knees are starting, is starting to hurt. And um, what kind of specialist do I go to? Like, yeah, like again. And so there's just so many things that come up with our bodies. And it's like, well, where do you go to? And I like, right. that you also have the avenue to connect people to experts if it's more than leveraging Rosie to um, be able to get the help that they need. So do you want to talk about how you're sourcing that? I know there's the great organization is Swish. So is that where you're getting most of the experts or how are you determining who people should be going to, to make sure they're getting the, the best help possible? Yeah, so we really view this in two ways. So we have all of our content, which is for which is filmed with a ton of ISWISH members, a ton of like as I said before, mental health people, pelvic floor PTs, really anybody who could be involved in sexual health. And then um, we launched Rosie Coaching, which is a little bit different than telehealth, which is I think maybe yep. what 
the track that you're on. So coaching really is for those who are listening, who are familiar with life coaching, it's a lot like life coaching, but around okay. sexual health issues. So these people, the, the coaches that we have on so far are Sonia is like our lead coach and she's a physician who then became a sexuality th- uh, counselor. And then now she became a life coach. So she um, will get on group calls, which are actually super powerful, but also individual one-on-one sessions with users and really work with them to kind of reframe how they're thinking about their sexual health issues. So, and this can be so liberating for women. We had a group, a big group coaching call last night, actually for our healthcare provider community, where we did a healthcare provider only coaching session. And it's, I mean, even as a physician, I have learned so much. These women who are on these calls learn so much because there's, as we've already covered, so much missing from our education when it comes to sexual health, both as women and as physicians. And uh, along with that lack of of evidence-based information comes these questions like, I've been trying to have an orgasm through penis and vagina sex for 20 years, and I can't seem to make it happen. And this was on the physician call last night. And I'm like, I'm so glad you asked this because this comes (laughs) up like literally every single time. And it's just, I mean, it's not our, our work while it's so important and so meaningful for so many women including myself it's not hard to be a myth buster because these are just easy easy things to that can really change people's lives to say hey 85 percent of women need clitoral stimulation to have an orgasm there's nothing wrong with you and you don't need to keep trying and ca- and you can also ca- please counsel your patients differently you know and so it's just those those network effects that we have on not only the women that we touch but the women in their communities their their children their partners their best friends their sisters their moms i think is such a you know such a powerful moment in time and really is um wrapped up in that group experience where you can hear other women expressing the same exact problems that maybe you've been struggling with in isolation for years because you have not had the opportunity, the platform, the outlet to have those conversations. And we're really offering that to our users, which is, I mean, so great, honestly. So I think that there's such an opportunity for there to be just like a worldwide, media-wide, you know, just change in the way that female orgasms are portrayed because otherwise we're all walking around thinking something's wrong with us. That's not the way we do it. So, you know, we must be broken. Uh, so frustrating. FemPower Health is pleased to partner with the upcoming FemTech and Consumer Innovation Summit. The summit is the latest deep dive event, part of the Women's Health Innovation Series, looking to tackle this growing sector of women's health, having had continental success in driving innovation, investment, research, and partnerships in traditional women's health care by bringing together critical stakeholders. Join us in New York on June 7th and 8th as we channel this success into the consumer sector of women's health. Visit www.femtechconsumerinnovation.com to view the superstar speaker lineup and enter code FEMPOWER15 for 15% off your ticket. Hope to see you there. Well, I guess one of the things I did want to say is I really like how this conversation is going where you're starting off with, I'm the OBGYN who struggled because I think even in um, the episode with Dr. Rubin, we talked about how a lot of times doctors don't bring this up. She mentioned that as a sexual health specialist, she has never been asked about her sexual health and how she's doing and how she's feeling. And it's because of this lack of education. And so I think it's so great that you're focusing on both the provider as well as the patient, because it's really that dual relationship because, mm-hmm. you know, just patients are using this and they go to their doctor, the doctor is going to be like, um, okay, great. Like, well, and, great. and <laughs> yes, and exactly. If you have not heard of a technology as a physician, I mean, we're bombarded with these like patients bringing in their test results all the time. And, you know, we're just, it's hard because you don't have time to go and vet everything on your own, you know? So the fact that we can make our presence known to physicians before the user or before the patient's coming in. And in fact, physicians are the way that we went to market and therapists are to have to, you know, they're sharing Rosie with their patients. And so we have more than 
6% currently in the United States sharing ROSI with their patients which of OBGYNs, which makes me so proud that we've been able to do that with such a small amount of funding. And it really just, I mean, definitely, I think the my need for this as an OBGYN, like help to position us that way. Um, but I think you're exactly right that without that dual sort of service model that we aren't going to make the impact that we want to make, which is to please encourage physicians to ask these questions and to please encourage women to be able to have those conversations with their healthcare providers, because I just don't think we're going to make the difference we want to without that as, uh, as part of it. What would you advise those who've been using Rosie and have their OBGYN appointment and go in and they're all excited, and but they still have questions. Do you have any use cases where women have gone into their doctor and they have a terrible conversation about, or maybe Rosie itself solves for things, but what if there needs to be that conversation, but the doctor doesn't yet know about Rosie and maybe potentially feel intimidated and doesn't know what to do? Like, what would you advise women to do? And second part of that is, do you have a list of healthcare providers that use Rosie so that women would know in advance, my doctor knows about this or my doctor doesn't just so they can frame that conversation because we don't want it to go downhill. Yeah, absolutely. That's such a good question. And we thought a lot about this, like, should we create like a directory? And I think that that definitely could be in our future. Um, because there, the great thing about doing this work is that there are so many physicians who are dying for this knowledge, who are who understand that there's a need for it, especially now that so many OBGYNs are women. Like we're not gonna be telling each other to drink a glass of wine. That's not gonna be happening. You know, we want, just like the whole menopause, we want our needs addressed in a respectful evidence-based way. And sexual health is no different. So I think, I think who has to get on board are like the medical training systems. And so we're working on that. Um, And there are actually more sexual health articles coming out in our publications now than there were, say, five years ago, which is exciting. Um, However, there's so much work to be done. So I would say, and this happens all the time, people come to us and they're like, hey, I talked to my doctor about this and they X, Y, Z, in some way that the patient felt dismissed, right, which happens to us as women all the time. And what we have to do is say, hey, You know, I think that there is a role where patients can um, help. And I have learned so much through my patients. I mean, there's, but I think that the physician has to be open to that, to your point. And if you find that you're in a relationship where that conversation doesn't go well and the physician sort of meets you with, you know, a, an attitude or a demeanor that is off-putting that in that moment we have to advocate for ourselves and we maybe maybe it's time to find a new provider to your point so and and oftentimes i will refer like for patients who have really significant pelvic pain that as an OBGYN, i am obligated to have someone who specializes in pelvic pain in my sort of you know referral channels or if someone's coming to me with sexual trauma i am obligated to have a sexual therapist to send that patient for further work on that so i think that in whenever i'm talking to physicians i my message is always hey you don't have to do it all but but you should know you're the gatekeeper to this wonderful opportunity for your patients, right? And so if this is not your area of focus, that's fine. You're not, no one's mad at you. Just like we don't treat gynecologic cancers for the most part, or we don't, you know, um, treat infertility for the most part. We might do the first few steps, but then after that we refer. The same can be said for sexual health and sexual medicine, because it is, there's a lot going on and you don't have to do it all, but I think it's very important that we be educated, You can educate yourself through a platform like Rosie. You can educate yourself through a number of amazing books um, like um, Come As You Are by Emily Nagoski, Becoming Cliterate by Lori Mintz, A Tired Woman's Guide to Passionate Sex by Lori Mintz. There's so much out there for you to just have a baseline level of education. Um, And then after that, have those referral sources. So um, I think that on the patient side, it's important to advocate for ourselves. On the physician side, the important thing is just to open the door to conversation and be, you know, have those people in your community to which to refer for sure. So maybe if it's a patient who's listening to uh, this episode, maybe what we need to do as part of our role is to tell our doctors about (laughs) Rosie and uh, maybe do it in a way of excitement and um, that it's also a tool to help physicians. 
Um, so maybe that's our, our job. So listeners, uh, let's advocate for Rosie. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and really, we're just there to save physicians yeah. times. That's our biggest yep. value prop is like, hey, we want to save you time while addressing this respectfully. And so anybody with an NPI, a national provider identifier can come to our website and sign up online. We'll send you patient cards. We'll give you complete access to the platform because I would never want you to recommend something that you hadn't fully vetted. Um, and so we really value those relationships with our healthcare providers all across the country. That's really a huge part of who we are as an organization. And we're so excited to have 100% of OBGYNs recommending Rosie to their patients. And that would be a huge, a huge gift to us if, if that were the case from, from your users as well. So thank you. Yeah, no, absolutely. And for those providers listening, I know that you and your colleagues collaborate a lot. So make sure to tell your colleagues about Rosie as well. So is there anything else you wanted to share with us that maybe it's a question I didn't ask, but it's something on your mind that, that you want to um, spread the word about? Um, you know, I, I want to thank you for this opportunity and for the work that you do, because you're helping to break down all of these barriers that we experience when it comes to women's health, when it comes to discussing these really specific and often sensitive concerns. And I know that involves you putting yourself out there personally. I know it involves a lot of your personal time, and clearly it's a passion of yours. So thank you for doing that work. Thank you for talking about women's sexual health and orgasms and endometriosis and infertility and all the things that women don't talk about because that work truly makes a difference. And, and the women who I know are, and their partners or your listeners, I know appreciate that as well. So thank you for your work, Georgie. Oh my gosh, you are so kind. You made my day because, you know, it, oh. it, it is a lot of work, but it's, it's such a passion. And, you know, I want to commend you for what you're doing because as someone who was a patient, who is a patient, I should say, and someone who's interviewed nearly, I think it's over 60 experts now in all women's health, and the themes are the same. And, you know, I've really looked at what's the, the issue here and why is this so hard? And, you know, it's, it's complex because you have what are insurance companies covering. You have the time that doctors are being allocated to be with patients, which is limited. And then what is it that women know about our health? And then what are researchers able to do? Because it's hard to get dollars for women's health and there isn't enough research so I love this love fest. Um, so last question for you. What is a fun fact about Dr. Lindsay Harper that we should be aware of? Surprise. Mm, surprise is right. <laughs> okay, I'm getting embarrassed. Um, okay, fun fact about Lindsay Harper. I have trouble with these. Um, I can do this really weird thing with my tongue, but people can't hear that on a podcast, but it's not that weird because other people can do it. I'll, okay. Here's one. I used to sing. That was my like passion growing up was singing. So I was, um, grew up in this, well, my high school had, a. I went to an all girl school. We had a madrigal choir, which is all acapella, but like old school, not like, not, uh, like the movie my kids watch. Um, where it's an acapella group, nothing cool or poppy, but very old school and traditional. And then, um, but we had the opportunity to perform at Carnegie Hall and at the White House and all kinds of fun things. So that's definitely a deep passion of mine. So when I'm finished changing the world for women's health, I'm sure I'll find some choir to join into my old age. Oh my gosh, <laughs> that is so cool. Um, well, thank, thank you. you for sharing that fun fact. And thank you again so much for everything you're doing. And I can't wait to share this episode with um, the audience. Well, thank you. I appreciate it, Georgie. Thanks for your support. I hope thank you for tuning in to this discussion on the FemPower Health podcast. You can refer to the show notes for links to information that is referred to in this episode. And if you like this episode and found it timely and valuable, please take a moment to tell a friend or a colleague about FemPower Health. And right after this episode is over, please think of one person who might find this episode helpful and tell them about it. And if your friend is new to podcasting, please show them how to subscribe to our show. And another way to support FemPower Health Podcast is to leave a review where you listen to podcasts. And as a reminder, the information shared by FemPower Health is not medical advice, but for information purposes to enable you to have more effective conversations with your doctor. Always talk to your doctor before making health-related decisions. Additionally, the views expressed by the FemPower Health Podcast guests are their own and their appearance on the program does not imply an endorsement of them or any entity they represent. See you next week.
Thank you for joining us on another enlightening episode of FemPower Health. No matter where you are in your journey, our website is brimming with content tailored to your specific topic of interest or life stage. Dive in and discover the resources and insights waiting for you. Your voice matters to us. And if you found value in this episode, please take a moment to write a review. Your feedback not only helps us improve, but it also helps others discover our podcast. By spreading the word, you're empowering women everywhere with the information they need to navigate their unique health journeys. And if this episode resonated with you, please don't keep it a secret. Share it with friends, loved ones, or anyone you believe would benefit from the information. Together, we can create a world where every woman feels supported, informed, and empowered. Remember, knowledge is power, and FemPower Health is here to guide you and support you in every step of the way. And as a reminder, the information shared by FemPower Health is not medical advice, but for informational purposes to enable you to have more effective conversations with your doctor always talk to your doctor before making health-related decisions. Additionally, the views expressed by the FemPower Health podcast guests are their own, and their appearance on the program does not imply an endorsement of them or any entity they represent. Until next time.